When you run a standard multiple regression using SPSS, you get several tables of output. The first table provides descriptive statistics for each variable in the regression. On average, people paid $5.92 for the album, their weekly disposable income was $108.09, and they estimated that others would pay around $4.53. The second table, which I'll just scroll down to, is a correlation matrix. In the first column, we can see that both predictors correlate substantially with the criterion. In the second column, though, we can see that they do not significantly correlate with each other. The third table is called Variables Entered and Removed. This table provides a summary of the variables in the regression. We can see here that there were two predictors entered into the regression together. These were price others would pay and weekly disposable income. And below the table, we can see that the criterion variable is price paid for the album. In the model summary table, there's a few figures of interest. The first of these is R squared, which indicates the proportion of variance in the criterion accounted for by the predictor variables in combination. In this case, disposable income and price others would pay can collectively account for 63.7% of the variance in prices that people paid for the album. Now R squared is a sample statistic and it tends to overestimate the true population effect. Consequently, it's recommended that you also report adjusted R squared, which is said to be a better estimate of the proportion of variance in price paid that would be accounted for by the two predictors in combination in the population from which we've sampled. Here though, the difference between the two figures is quite small anyway. Now, part of the purpose of regression is to build a model that can be used to make predictions. In this case, the model contains two variables, weekly disposable income and price others would pay, and these are being used to predict the prices that customers paid for the album. Because the model's not perfect, and we already know that these variables can only account for about 64% of the variance in prices paid, any predictions made with it will be off or inaccurate to some degree. The standard error of estimate is a measure of how much we'd expect predictions to be off on average. So on average we would expect that any predictions made using this model will be off by an average of $2.07. The ANOVA table reports the null hypothesis significance test for R squared. The null hypothesis for this test is that R squared does not depart significantly from zero. Here we can reject this null hypothesis because the significance value is less than alpha which we typically set at 0.05. So in other words, R squared departs significantly from zero. In combination, the predictors can account for a significant proportion of the variance in prices paid for the album. In the coefficients table, there's quite a few figures. I'm not going to explain them all. Firstly, we'll look at the constant, which is negative 0.279. So this is the value we would predict for the criterion, price paid, when both predictors are fixed at zero. You should be wary about interpreting this value though if you haven't sampled around zero on all variables. The partial unstandardized regression coefficient, or B, for disposable income is 0 0.025. For each unit, or dollar increase in weekly disposable income, we would predict a corresponding 0.025 dollar or 2.5 cent increase in the price a customer is willing to pay for the album after controlling for or holding constant the other predictors in the model. Now the corresponding t-test tells us that this regression coefficient departs significantly from zero. So in other words, weekly disposable income is a significant predictor. It has predictive utility. The partial unstandardized regression coefficient for price others would pay is 0.771. If we hold disposable income constant, we would predict that a $1 increase in the estimated price others would pay would correspond to a 77.1 cent increase in the price that participants would pay for the album. And looking at the relevant t-test, we can see that this predictor is also statistically significant. 
Now the confidence intervals around each of these partial regression coefficients are reported to the right of the significance tests. Now in addition to the unstandardized coefficients, we also have a set of standardized coefficients called beta. These indicate the standard deviation change in the criterion associated with a one standard deviation change in the relevant predictor, whilst controlling for any other predictors in the model. Also in the coefficients table we have a set of correlations. The zero order correlations are the same as those reported in the correlation matrix above, the correlations between each predictor and the criterion. The part correlations can be squared to provide squared semi-partial correlations. A squared semi-partial correlation indicates the amount of unique variance in the criterion that can be accounted for by a predictor. If we square 0.419, which is the part correlation for disposable income, we get 0.175. So in other words, disposable income can uniquely account for about 17.5% of the variance in prices paid for the album. And we already know that this is a significant amount because we've already looked at the corresponding t-test. Now on the far right of the coefficients table we have a set of collinearity statistics. These are used to assess the absence of multicollinearity assumption underpinning multiple regression and their interpretation is described in StatHand. In StatHand there is also information about detecting outliers using the information in the residual statistics table. For now though we'll skip past this. And finally there are three charts that can be used to assess the assumptions of normality, linearity and homoscedasticity of residuals. Again the interpretation of these is described in StatHand. So this is how you might summarize the results of these analyses. To estimate the proportion of variance in prices that customers would pay for the album using both weekly disposable income and customers' estimates of what others would pay, standard multiple regression was used. In combination, the two predictors could account for a significant 63.7% of the variance in prices paid for the album. As illustrated in Table 1, both predictors account for a significant proportion of unique criterion variants. In the full write-up, you would probably also need to include the results of your assumption tests, and these are described in StatHand.